Hello, everyone, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to BBA Forum, our first meeting of uh, 2022. I am Dr. Naseem Nakwi, BBA President, and today we have uh, a blockchain for healthcare uh, masterclass with uh, two excellent uh, speakers, and I will introduce uh, them to you shortly. Uh, first of all, uh, we would like to give you a, a very quick update on our upcoming uh, fourth uh, blockchain international uh, scientific conference and uh, why you absolutely cannot afford to miss uh, this event. So firstly, we will have some great speakers at the conference. So we have very carefully selected uh, some of the uh, top quality speakers for uh, this event and the agenda and the content uh, looks great. The registrations are open and we have uh, already had uh, uh, excellent uh, interest from the blockchain community. And I would like to quickly go through some of the keynote speakers that we have confirmed. Um, so firstly, we have um, uh, John Glenn, Member of Parliament and also the Economic Secretary to the Treasury. Uh, this is the man who has been uh, instrumental behind the um, uh, crypto assets policy making in the UK. We uh, will have two excellent opening and closing keynotes from our uh, distinguished uh, members of uh, Parliament, who are also the chairs and co-chairs of uh, UK all-party parliamentary group on blockchain, uh, Martin and uh, Lord Holmes. And they're also the key contributors to uh, the UK blockchain roadmap. We have uh, key industry keynotes from uh, Dr. Helene, who is the manager of uh, payments and crypto policy at the Financial Conduct Authority. Um, we have um, Professor Sarah Green from Law Commission, uh, she's also the author of the recently published uh, landmark report on smart legal contracts, which was presented to Parliament recently in November. And um, I suggest you check it out. It's a uh, it's very good quality um, report and recommendations. We also have Dr. Roger Kuranting, who is the head of uh, public sector governance at the Commonwealth. And he has been uh, one of the pioneers who is spearheading the uh, utility of blockchain for anti-corruption uh, and governance across all uh, 53 Commonwealth countries. Uh, and he is giving uh, a guest speech in the morning of the conference. And of course, uh, you will also get a chance to meet our newly elected fellows uh, at the fellowship um, induction ceremony, and also get to hear from our excellent guest speakers uh, who are going to uh, be talking about a very wide range of uh, related topics from blockchain in healthcare to cybersecurity, enterprise, industry, governance, social impact, and so on. We have an uh, academic track uh, in the morning with uh, over a dozen excellent peer-reviewed research abstracts, uh, presentations. And from this year, we have also introduced uh, rewards for active participation and networking at the, uh, at the event. So this is uh, quite an exciting initiative. So delegates will be awarded based on how actively they participate. So if you have asked a, a very thought provoking, enlightening, excellent question, and it is upvoted, then you will uh, score points for that. And at the end of the conference, you will uh, look at who was the most active uh, delegate at the, at the conference. So it's kind of a fun activity that we've introduced just to encourage more people to uh, actively engage with the speakers and the content. Um, and of course, uh, last but not the least, you get a certificate of attendance. And um, we are also grateful to our 
sponsors and conference partners for supporting um, the conference. So without uh, further ado, uh, I would like to introduce um, our first speaker, Simon Dyson. Uh, Simon is going to be talking about um, medical records on the blockchain, a very important topic, something which has been explored quite extensively. Um, and he's also going to discuss about the data breaches and the forensic investigators perspective. Simon is uh, the, our editor of healthcare section at the JBBA. And he's also cybersecurity operations center lead uh, at NHS Digital. Uh, here is Simon in 2019, March of 2019, presenting his research on blockchain investigations and the forensic toolbox. And if you have not read his research, I would recommend you to check it out. It's, uh, it's on the JPBA. Uh, and in this research, he, he explores uh, the various cyber crimes uh, and, and, and personal information uh, stored on blockchain and how it can be hacked and what can we do to prevent these hacks. And he's going to be talking more about that today. So um, over to you, Simon. I will stop sharing my my slides. <clears throat> Excellent. Okay, I was just trying to start my video, but uh, that's not working. But two seconds, and I'll uh, just try and share my screen. Okay, so. Are you able to um, see that? I'll just put it in presenter yes, mode. Yes, yes, yes. You can see that, can you? Excellent. Okay. Um, marvelous. So um, thank you very much for, for, for inviting me uh, first off. Um, uh, it's great to be here and, and talking to a wide range of people on a, on a Sunday evening. So um, how secure are medical records on the blockchain, uh, data breaches and the forensic investigators perspective? So. I've just flicked to another slide. So I'm just going to ask, is that flicked to the next slide? Just so now we're working. Yes, I did. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That's great. Because uh, I can't I can't see my screen now. So that's marvelous. So um, so yeah, so uh, quick introduction to myself. So um, uh, I look after the uh, cybersecurity center within NHS Digital, uh, and we support um, the wider NHS organizations looking after um, kind of the threats that, uh, that, that hit us. So uh, we have a threat intelligence team, threat hunting, protective monitoring, uh, and we help support uh, in, in incidents. Um, so obviously, we've had a busy period with, uh, with the pandemic. Um, we've supported things like the Nightingales, uh, assisted around uh, uh, test and trace, uh, and some of the organizations that, uh, that work there. Uh, and also um, vaccine rollout, uh, as well as uh, all, all the other things that kind of roll in as normal business. Um, uh, and as already sort of described, I'm uh, uh, an editor uh, with the JBBA. Um, some of my certifications, so I'm a, a certified cloud security professional. Uh, I've got CISP as well, which is the uh, information system security. Uh, and I was lucky enough to uh, study an MSc uh, while working with Edinburgh Napier. So I've worked with some of the great, great people from up there. Um, previous roles were law enforcement uh, as a detective there, worked in the regional organized crime unit. Uh, so as a cyber crime investigator uh, and also doing some forensics there. And then most of my policing career was in uh, counter-terrorism before I switched across to NHS Digital. So um, published bits and pieces. So again, sort of a, a bit of a theme, but um, challenges of investigating cryptocurrencies and blockchain related crime. So, uh, so that was a kind of a bit more of a study into privacy preserving. Uh, so things like ZK snarks and uh, Monero ring signatures uh, so I, I did that alongside um, Professor Bill Buchanan and, and, and Liam Bell from uh, from uh, Edinburgh Napier. Um, blockchain Beyond the Money will we'll kind of visit again shortly. Uh, and then another paper was a scenario-based creation and digital investigation of Ethereum uh, ERC20 tokens. Uh, and again, that was sort of part of my studies at Edinburgh. So that looked at um, kind of tracking uh, across across Ethereum networks, basically, for, uh, for investigation. Um, and I've recently kind of been um, a con contributing author to Blockchain Impact, uh, which is a book which has just come out uh, 
on, on Projectus Publishing. So there's lots of great kind of articles and, uh, and people writing there. So I was really honored to be to be part of that. So um, enough about me. So the, um, the, the purpose really of the talk is to kind of uh, discuss the um, uh, how, how healthcare can be can be benefited really from uh, from blockchain, uh, you know, and you know if it will make it secure. Um, so there's some great benefits that come from decentralization in itself. You know, we know that blockchain delivers kind of transparency. You know, it's it's immutable by nature. Um, and there's some great cost savings that, you know, can be had by using these systems. Um, and it kind of builds, you know, ecosystems of trust. So some of the common uh, places where, where it's already been identified to help and there's kind of, you know, items already out there and, and being delivered. Um, decentralized identities is, you know, one thing where I think, you know, the whole um, cybersecurity industry will be benefited by having, um, you know, a, a better go at passwords and, and decentralized identities, you know, provides, you know, potentially a route of doing that. Um, supply chain, uh, you know, we've seen over the last few years in cybersecurity just how important that is. Um, so we can talk about proper physical supply chains. Um, so pharmaceutical kind of medical industries, you know, building and delivering their um, their medical products. Um, and then also the logistical uh, chains of, of following it through and delivering it to, uh, you know, to medical healthcare settings. There's also um, supply chains with IoT uh, and medical devices. Um, the uh, the supply chain can be bolstered by using kind of blockchain technology to to trap and uh, map uh, and ultimately you know kind of keep keep track of, of devices and make sure you don't have kind of rogue uh, and spoofed devices. Elect uh, electronic healthcare records, you know, is um, is an area that, you know, it can uh, can clearly bring immutability um, and and availability, which is another kind of important aspect that you know that we need to kind of track and follow. Um, payment services, so you know, this is just about kind of cost saving, really um, having to kind of deal with uh, intermediate and, and third parties. Um, patient data, so um, sharing data. You know, is um, is an important aspect that we'll kind of you know visit visit again. But you know, this one in particular is about um, the uh, patient as being the data controller, uh, and that's a bit of a move a little bit wider, you know, throughout society as being in control of our own data. Um, genomics data, you know, we've already seen an excellent paper in the JBBA uh, uh, around Genome Bank, which is a, an excellent paper to go and have a look at. Um, health tech and data syncing your wearables, uh, and then also just data sharing. So data sharing um, within the medical setting for research, uh, universities, um, even kind of independent pharmaceutical companies. You know, if we look at, you know, the, the pandemic, there's been a lot of, um, a lot of activity in that area. And, and that provides a, you know, a great, a great way of doing it. And using smart contracts and uh, getting rid of intermediaries is, uh, is a really good way to do that. So the CIA triad um, is uh, something that we use in security quite a lot. So we talk about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And ultimately what it means is, you know, we, we need to keep it safe um, so that only the legitimate users can access. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we achieve that by using strong encryption uh, and, uh, and, and private keys to, to achieve that. The integrity, the unaltered nature of, of blockchain means that um, you know the, the immutable structure kind of preserves that integrity. So it's a great way of achieving uh, this 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 part of the security triad. Um, and we also need to make sure that you know the consensus methods are secure and also node security. So you don't have the kind of attacks that you can uh, you can have on the um, you know the consensus, the fifty one percent attacks in a public chain, for example. Um, and then availability. So availability is really good within a large decentralized network. So you you know you permissionless and your public blockchains, um, and that's something you also need to kind of consider with your private blockchain. Um, have you got enough nodes in order to kind of you know keep that availability um, there? So common smart contract attacks. Um, you know these are kind of permission, permissionless, public and private potential. Um, uh, so re-entrancy uh, is probably an important one that some of you may have heard of with, with a number of attacks, things like the DAO attack, which happened some, some time ago in the uh, early days of Ethereum. But that's where, 
uh, a contract is kind of programmed in a way that a function um, is able to be interact interacted with uh, and sometimes that's with another malicious contract um, and the example is where you're able to go around the loop drain the funds um, but part of the function is, is kind of removed where it does the check to see you know if, if the function has been uh, done before um, you know have I got the balance am, am I allowed to spend that money and it just goes round and round and drains the account so there's quite quite a number of re-entrancy uh, items that have uh, drained millions and millions of pounds from some of these uh, public public blockchains denial of service you know is, uh, is an attack that happens on uh, on uh, all states of uh, machines either kind of memory and uh, uh, and service protocol attacks but within a smart contract it, it's still the same you know so uh, you're basically denying the ability for, for people to use the system because you're gobbling up the resource. So if that's putting it into a bit of a death spiral in a smart contract, uh, it's normally down to the logic of the contract itself. Um, call handling. So this is where, um, you know, I guess it's a validation sort of attack where, um, you know, you expect it to do one thing. Uh, but uh, the attacker comes in and does something completely different. And that's where you get an unexpected result from that call. Um, and that might result in a DOS attack or, uh, or it might result in, you know, drained, drained funds or, you know, something that you couldn't predict. Uh, and that's where kind of testing of your smart contracts becomes really important. Uh, race conditions, which is uh, something that's a bit more in the in the uh, public space, but that's where you're able to, um, you know, potentially look at look at the Ethereum mempool, for example. You know, you see a transaction in there. You want to submit a transaction. You want to get in front of it, and you you'll pay more gas and basically nip up the miners' queue. So it's not necessarily something for the for the uh, for the private chains. Random randomness is another attack, which is quite quite uh, popular and that happens across lots of you know cyber applications and that's where the uh, the encryption is uh, is done by an algorithm that um, uh, creates a random number but if you don't create it random enough uh, and you can guess it thousands and thousands of times and you know something can read it and, and generate how you know what what the next uh, number is going to be uh, it just becomes a, an attack vector so uh, you know that that still is you know something that, that will be looked at um, timestamp, I'll kind of skip over that quickly, sort of conscious of time, but uh, that, that's more of a, a dependent uh, for the public mining space. Um, and then overflow attacks is something that, you know, happens in uh, various different uh, applications uh, and in smart contracts, it's still the same. So it's where there's an expected length um, of something to be to be processed and you can either underflow or overflow. And there's quite a few attacks that have resulted in, you know, million pound losses in, uh, in a number of blockchains. So private blockchains, um, you know, they, they still have the same... Um, vulnerabilities that, that you would do with other general systems. So identity and access management becomes really kind of prevalent. So, you know, your keys to the kingdom uh, are what you need to what you need to protect, how you enroll people in, how you enroll them out. Uh, and ultimately, if someone gets hold of the um, admin or privileged accounts for uh, for a hyperledger um, deployment, for example, you know, then then someone's got access to data and someone can, you know, start to start to do um, malicious things. Um, platform and software vulnerabilities, you know, are still prevalent. Uh, and, and you would need to kind of make sure that you, um, you know, have a good vulnerability management program to make sure that, you know, your, all your web applications and everything in the ecosystem. And that's why it comes back to kind of supply chain. We've seen recently with Log4j, the vulnerability, just how, you know, one, one small application can be buried everywhere, you know, and it'll be the same for, uh, you know, for um, anything that's running, you know, we we'll use Hyperledger as an example, but any of the other um, kind of private systems that are kind of rolled out will still have dependencies. It's important to make sure that, you know, we're on top of that vulnerability side. Um, consensus attacks are still something to consider. Um, uh, and inside a threat, you know, is something that you'd always need to protect against. Um, there are smart contract vulnerabilities, and we've we've kind of discussed a couple of them quickly. Um, you know, and that's something that you you can you know use the um, SWC smart contract weakness classification for, uh, for 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 some types. But I don't think there's a general kind of one that that covers kind of cross cross systems yet. Um, 
So blockchain investigations uh, beyond the money was uh, was a paper that wanted to um, I wanted to basically look at um, something a little bit different. So we've um, if you look at kind of research, a lot of it is kind of based around blockchains, uh, around uh, deployment, scalability, etc. Uh, there's not many around investigations, and, and those that are around investigations concentrate mainly on money. Um, so I wanted to kind of put something forward that kind of switched that around. So uh, so it was a case of stealing data and hosting it um, in uh, IPFS, Interplanetary File System, um, having an attacker basically try and you know ransom an organization uh, and then host that material there because you can't do anything about it. You can't take it down. You can't block it. Um, you can't have a legal warrant. You know it, it's out there, out there to be. Uh, um there for, for forever basically um and it was just like a bit of a different twist and then work out all the different steps and um you know where would a forensic investigator start to look how could they um still interact how could they still investigate um and in this example you know you had to actually have an ethereum name and system domain so it could be hosted there were transactions within uh, ethereum swarm um there were smart contract calls and uh, various different bits and pieces the uh, the hash you know the the name hash you know was still processed um, there was interactions with the API and the, and the different parts of the system. Um, but there was also forensic information that was still available. Um, so the material that was stolen was a set of files and some images, you know, they were put into IPFS, but they were also then downloaded by the investigator who had the, who had the, um, uh, the uh, details to go and find it. And then it was a case of kind of reversing back through that, um, looking at the metadata around it, being able to prove that they were the same files, looking at other kind of, you know, geodata that was, uh, you know, were attached to the images um, and, you know, really look at what opportunities, you know, were there. So that's really important, I think, for, um, you know, as, uh, as we go forward for things like hosted malware. Um, you know, I think there'll be a point where we start to see, um, you know, immutable malware kind of stuck, stuck as a resource and then different pointers pointing to it. You know, we've already had like kind of part, parts of that. Uh, it's not widespread, but it, but it has been done. Um, and you never know, you might see, uh, you know, ransomware smart contracts that, that do all of that for you. So, um, so that's it. So um, uh, I shall go to any other questions or finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Simon, this was an excellent talk. Um, <clears throat> I don't think there are any questions. Uh, maybe we'll take questions in the end after Sean's talk. But I just wanted to ask one question about uh, the data hacks, uh, especially in the UK context. So are there any um, instances where the uh, data was uh, hacked uh, from the blockchain? Uh, in terms of like medical records in the NHS uh, from a hospital setting? Yeah, so um, yeah, as, as far as I'm aware, and obviously I'm, I'm, I'm talking as a security researcher, not from my uh, NHS digital role, but um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of any that have been taken from, uh, you know, from, from a blockchain um, deployment. Um, so certainly nothing that's uh, that, that's come past me, but um, you know, I think I think the question really is, you know, is is it possible? And I think if you're an attacker, you you maybe you know kind of flip it the other way. You wouldn't necessarily attack the blockchain end, which is quite secure. You know, you'd kind of go for end devices and and for users, you know, and kind of switch it switch it that way. But uh, yeah, there's uh, yeah, where you where you harden one bit, they'll they'll go for a softer bit elsewhere. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. Thank so you. If, you have, um, if you have any more questions, uh, attendees, please uh, feel free to post in the chat box. So uh, thank you again, Simon. So I'll move on to uh, our next speaker, Dr. Sean uh, Menion, who is the editor of uh, healthcare section of the JBBA. He's also the chief scientific officer at Equidium Health and a fellow of the British Blockchain Association. Um, here is Simon. Uh, in, in 2020, just at the start of the pandemic, uh, came all the way from, from USA to uh, participate and be a judge at our international scientific conference in Edinburgh. And um, here he is presenting uh, his work on blockchain for clinical trials in healthcare. So I'm very grateful to Sean for uh, uh, coming today. Here's Sean again, uh, bottom left corner, moderating a panel at uh, our ISC 2021 uh, last year. So uh, Sean, 
over to you. He's going to talk about blockchain for healthcare. What are the lessons learned and uh, the journey to date? Thank you, Simon. Thank you, uh, Sean. Uh, hello, there we are. Um, let me get my, my slides up, please. And I will be with you in just a moment. Uh, Dr. Nakhdi, this is uh, always an honor to work with you. So I appreciate the, the chance to um, talk here about a, a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, the, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Sean Mannion. I am a, I'm a neuroscientist by training. Um, but uh, I, I spent a lot of time in the US federal government as a research administrator. And, um, and then um, and around 2016, and I'll talk about the, the, the impetus there, I moved into, into the tech sector um, uh, initially slowly and then, and then very, very quickly um, fell into the world of blockchain and healthcare. Um, I am the chief scientific officer and federated network orchestration lead at Equidium Health, which is um, a, just a brand new branding for what was Consensus Health, Consensus Health, which has been around for a couple of years since we spun off of um, our, our former parent company, Consensus. Um, but we are a, an, an independent healthcare company within the Consensus Mesh portfolio um, uh, called Equidium Health. Um, I am also a fellow um, and editor at uh, fellow of the British Blockchain Association and editor at the Journal of the British Blockchain Association, which I've been very, very happy to do. I'm always excited about the work that is being done to to standardize and 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 bring into the the, the peer reviewed and the evidence based world um, a lot of work that is going on. Much of it on the private side that doesn't have the same tradition. Of, of moving things through that same check and balance, but especially in healthcare, if you don't have that, it's very hard to move into the legacy system. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I work with a number of different um, other nonprofit organizations, Health Informatics Management System Society, uh, IEEE, IEEE Standards Association, ACT IACT. I also serve in, in different capacities at uh, other journals focused on blockchain um, uh, frontiers and, uh, and, and ledger. Um, and, and this has given me the chance to really see the broad realm of things in blockchain and health, healthcare as it, it is developed, having come from the world of, of research and clinical research and, 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 and uh, health, healthcare in general, I've been able to see the pain points there and then understand how these technologies can move into those pain points. Um, I think one general pain point in blockchain and healthcare I like to highlight is that as there is not enough peer reviewed literature to really start to bring a lot of people over, they're, they're, they're moving very slowly over to the, the possibilities of using these technologies, blockchain and other emerging technologies. But until they see what they trust and the trust that underlies their system, it's going to be hard to get there. So the, the, the British Blockchain Association and, and the Journal of the British Blockchain Association have done a tremendous job moving that needle forward. And I, I want to continue to see that work, um, work move forward. So um, my talk is on, on blockchain for healthcare and the journey to date and lessons learned. Um, I'm gonna be at a much higher level than, than Simon. Thank you for a great presentation, just because there's, there's, there's really so much to cover that I can't get into the weeds on, on any of it. Um, I, I, I do appreciate that when things have a, a, a beginning and the beginning is never the beginning, you know, Satoshi and, and, and Bitcoin is often talked about as the beginning of blockchain, but there was work in the early nineties and even stretching back into blockchain ciphering in the seventies, which was precursor to that. And as, as evidenced by what was referenced in, in Satoshi's original white paper. And of course, the, the August 2016 was not the first time anyone talked about blockchain and healthcare, but it really was an event that pulled together a large amount of work already being done and opened up a lot of people's eyes, including my own, to what could be done. In this case, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Office of the National Coordinator, hosted a white paper contest on what blockchain could do for healthcare. Blockchain at the time was, you know, mostly just a, a fintech um, look, there had been some activity in other industries, but healthcare had a lot of just small pockets of interest and activities, but nothing that had been really rolled out. Um, they were overwhelmed. I, I, I have the, the fortune to, to work now with Debbie Bucci, who was the, the driver of that when she was a federal employee at, at Health and Human Services and now works with us at Equidium Health. Um, that was um, a, a, a surprise to them that they got um, more than 70 entrants they, they thought, ah, there's probably a few people looking at this. They got 70 entrants from around the world 
on white papers for blockchain and healthcare. All of that is available online. You can look it up. It's, it's actually great to look through those things, which only five and a half years ago were, were, were at the forefront of all of the thinking of it. Now, in five years, there's been, there's been conferences, there's been papers, there's been uh, peer-reviewed publications, and many, many more um, publications of different sorts that are in the gray literature or, or, or not peer-reviewed. Um, but there have been pilots, there have been some successes, but there's been lots of learning, which is another way of saying there's been failures as well. And that's, that's, that's how it happens. Um, I know some people get unnerved by that, especially, you know, in a very rapid moving tech world, like if you don't succeed quickly, then, you know, oh, something's happened. I'm a scientist. It takes 17 years to go from bench to bedside. And, and for me, we've barely even started scratching the surface and it's actually moving a pace in a way that I think people should be very happy with the, the 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 pace of changing healthcare, the pace of changing things within that environment is generally so slow that you can't expect to have snap things change overnight. And I think that's one of the most important lessons that that, that we need to take away is that what seems slow from a tech side industry is actually very rapid in 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 the healthcare and in, in the life sciences setting. Um, there's a lot of promise that's driving this. And I think that's probably some of the feeling and the urgency. You know, it's a multi-trillion dollar worldwide industry any way you slice it. Healthcare is, is, is enormous in its, in its cost and its burden, as, as well as the money that's being made on it. Um, it's multiple intersecting systems. And these are, these are public and private. These are, these are cross multiple countries. These are, these are systems of data sharing, or in some cases not sharing. That are, that are very, very complex and do not function smoothly. So on the one hand, the bar is very, very low for being able to improve things and being able to succeed. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a low trust environment. And so the, the automated trust or the digital trust that the blockchain can bring can indeed improve that, but you need to penetrate an, a, an industry that doesn't necessarily trust every new thing that comes down the pike. And that's a very important, that's a very important thing to realize is that they the the people within healthcare and life sciences may not trust these new technologies and so they see more more proof in action in the places that they trust not just hey it came out in the headlines it came out in the papers but where's the peer-reviewed literature that went through the methodology that went through the details that went into this where's the the, the replication um, of, of the studies that, that, that were done, where is the proof in the pudding? Where are the health outcome studies that tell me that this in fact is something that's improving lives and not just um, you know, uh, another video game? Um, and, and the community of interest is absolutely every person on the planet. Not everyone might care about healthcare at every given moment of their lives, but at some point or another when they or them, their, their um, loved ones are sick, they do. Um, there's a lot of challenges. Those interlocking systems, as I said, it's highly regulated, and that regulation varies across countries, across different municipalities. Um, it's it's and it's a regulation that differs from financial regulation. You know, it's not just oops, get fined and pay the fine and move on. You know, as as we see in very high profile cases like Theranos, if you don't meet certain standards, you can go to jail. And, and, and you need to realize that, that there's, there's a much bigger barrier for risk in, in that regulation. Um, the data is a mess. I'll say it that way. Heterogeneous is a nice word. The data is extremely non-standardized. It's extremely variable, both in type and quality. Um, and, and if you can't deal with that from a, from a data standpoint, you can't do anything that's effective and has clinical applications. And again, there we get into the, the clinical aspect is, is mistakes can kill. And if you are not aware of that, then you, you can very easily do something that not only hurts somebody else, but brings risk back to whoever it is to, who's trying the pilot. Um, blockchain and healthcare and life sciences has grown very rapidly. I mentioned there's five years of, you know, we could, we could write a paper on it and we probably should. And actually we're working with uh, uh, folks at Artifacts who, who support some of the, the, the Journal of the British Blockchain Association's ledger, as well as Dell Medical School to try and capture the, the entirety and set up a library for blockchain and healthcare, which is really indexed across multiple systems and sometimes not indexed at all. That's a different, different project in its own right. But as you see here, um, especially in the US payer provider uh, organizations, which differs from the, the, the UK system, um, is very interested in, in this. But, but uh, pharma is, is uh, the pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical industry is very interested in this technology as well. And a lot of effort is going towards um, making these technologies available, not just within a particular entity, 
but across entities. And I didn't cover some of the government efforts in here, but I wanted to, to focus on, on some of the, um, the private efforts. One of the biggest lessons learned, and I think one of the biggest takeaways moving forward, is that doing blockchain applications for any particular use case within a closed system only has a limited benefit, but the truly transformational benefit comes working across partners that normally can't trust each other. And this is why there's so much exploration in, in this consortium model. And there's, there's a number of different uh, structural business model and technical barriers to moving these forward. And some are having more success than others. Melody has had some great success with blockchain and federated learning in drug discovery. All of these others have been moving the needle forward in different use cases that they've, they've been uh, focused on. Um, one in particular, this, this is a, a grant funded project by the Innovation Medicines Initiative in, in, in the EU um, called Pharma Ledger. We've had the uh, opportunity to support. And so I know, I, and, they, and they're very open about what they've been doing. It's, it's publicly available. Um, so I've, I've picked out their use cases to give people who aren't familiar with it, the broad array. Blockchain and healthcare isn't a single use case. It's a whole array of use cases. And I didn't even list here that there's a bunch of financial and, and use cases that look like FinTech, but are in fact just um, uh, you know, uh, uh, an application within the healthcare setting of what's being done in fintech, but supply chain management for clinical supply chain, finished goods traceability, anti-counterfeiting, these are all supply chain applications within healthcare that are being explored, particularly in the biopharma industry. Personalized medicines is per perhaps a bit more of a future uh, look, and we'll touch on that in just a second, but these dynamic permis permissioning and e-consent, being able to get people to consent to the use of their data in secondary uses is, is, is a huge opportunity to do more with health data and to accelerate knowledge translation and improve out the health outcomes. Um, IOT medical devices, and of course, clinical trial recruitment, which is one of the things that, that we've worked with Intel on and we've been focused on ourselves, but is, is of interest to Pharma Ledger um, in general. These are just a, a, a sampling of the use cases. There is, there is a myriad. It's like saying, what can blockchain do for healthcare? What can, what can the internet do for healthcare? These, these, these are wide, these are different, they don't all move the same. And so sometimes thinking of blockchain and healthcare as, as, as an array of different things at different maturity levels is important. Um, very briefly, uh, lessons learned. I've, I've, I've taken what we think of as lessons learned into what are the macro trends of the future. Um, here, blockchain is, is necessary, but not sufficient for applications in many places. And, and it's necessary to bring one, AI. Um, most people don't even care about blockchain, but they do care about AI in, 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 in different digital health settings. Blockchain can work with AI in, a, in an auditing capacity, in a, in a revealing bias capacity that is, that is being explored. These are some of the intersections between the trends in healthcare and the trends in blockchain and AI that, that, that we've been seeing and, and I've captured as kind of lessons learned. Um, you know, this move to precision, this move to applied behavioral economics, which the incentivization and cryptocurrency component of health of, of uh, blockchain can do. I always see as a, a cryptocurrency as an advanced use case for blockchain. They're going to need to go with the training wheels first, usually in an enterprise setting, eventually moving towards something that looks more like the open decentralized systems. And, and, and where those hybridize and where those are ideal for any particular use case can, can, can differ quite a bit. Um, move to uh, per, person-centered medicine. These, these, this, is, this is definitely the value of blockchain in the future, putting the person first. Um, blank as a service, uh, that's, that's gonna be sort of the, the industry application into many of the legacy healthcare systems, whether it be a, a, a government system like the UK has or, or a large uh, payer systems like the US has and a move towards data decentralization. Data is getting too much to always centralize. It's too costly when it gets hacked. So keeping a federated approach, deploying the algorithm, deploying the query to the data rather than the reverse. And that takes certain privacy components along with blockchain as well. Um, the convergence of this is really what we see as, as the future um, and, and, and sort of lessons learned encapsulated in, you know, over the last five years of exploration. Um, I also see this as, uh, an opportunity um, for me, uh, you know, uh, knowledge at uh, 10,000 times faster, clinical decision support now, 17 years from bench to bedside condensed down into under 12 hours. This would be the, 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 the output I want to see from applications of blockchain, privacy preserving technologies and decentralized AI in healthcare. And blockchain is, 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 the, is the foundation of all of that. It allows for trust to be built into systems, into human systems in a way that we just don't have now. Um, and and I've, 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 I've 
brought together a group of um, about 30 public and private representatives from different companies, big and small, from different government agencies, from different academic agencies. And we're exploring what a roadmap to get to this in the next five to 10 years would look like, not from a, a single company or single government or entity, but you really looking across all of the, the applications that are out there. Um, with that, I will stop and open for questions. Again, this was a very high level thing. I think we need an ac academic dive into all the fine details that have gone into it because there are literally hundreds of, of different different projects and attempts that, 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 that can be pulled together. And, and of course, you know, BBA is, is always being uh, the lead on that sort of thing. And so I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. This is an um, excellent talk. Um, I think I don't think see any questions, but uh, I wanted to ask about um, the two approaches to um, uh, blockchain utility in healthcare. So one is the the top down approach, and the other is the, the bottom up. So the economies that are looking to explore blockchain for healthcare is, is there any data or any studies or projects uh, looking at which approach worked better? Is starting with the policy makers, the CEOs, executives, or, or starting from the patient and, um, and going up? Is there any data on that? Um, that? That's a good question. I have not seen, I have seen some formal analysis of, of blockchain and healthcare efforts from uh, who's done uh, an ICO and what was the success factor of that of those but of course that's not that's a that's a very isolated question a very limited question i think um there's a there's a question a couple of questions in the chat and yours is along the lines of the number one there um, I, I don't think we've seen that 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 meta analysis, if you will, or that systematic uh, systematic review of it from a, from a you know a, 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 an anecdotal low, lower lower cross section of of the evidence pyramid that you and I both like so much. Um, you know, I have seen that there there's um, some success from a top down perspective. You take uh, you know the HHS Accelerate, which um, was a U.S. Uh, effort to um, uh, have a blockchain for um, faster purchasing and taking 30,000 buyers instead of them waiting three or four months for there to be uh, you know, a, a, a cost-effective a purchase uh, explained to them out on the perimeter. They connected all of the folks who were across Jose area at ETA did that. He was able to do that because he oversaw as the acquisition lead all of those 30,000. So in that case, it was a top-down, but it was a closed system. You can't scale that. That's, that's not something that's scalable. I think to get something much more scalable and much more widespread, you need to go from bottom up. And there's a lot of efforts to, to do that, to bring the patients in, into a collective group, to bring the, 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 the providers into a collective group. But, but from my experience, and I say this both uh, having been in, involved in academic science as well as government research, um, I, I think it takes a hybrid approach. I think if you try and do just one or the other, you, you have a very difficult battle. From the top down, you know, as long as you maintain control and you can tell people what to do, they do it. But if 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 something moves away, then then it changes. From the bottom up, you can get that more lasting, effective change, but it takes forever, and sometimes you never get off the ground. And a lot of a lot of efforts never get off the ground. Figuring out how to hybridize that, I think, is 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 really one of the the, the, the key ways ahead. To, but just, that's just from ob observation. Haven't had a chance to do a formal analysis of that. Yes, absolutely, indeed. Thank you, thank you for that. So we have a couple of questions. Uh, there's one from Jorge Ferrer, and he's asking about um, consortium-based projects. Uh, how long do you think before real-world use case becomes reality? And have consortium-based projects yielded any progress? I guess he's asking about any tangible progress in terms of patient outcomes, data. So these consortium-based projects that you mentioned, Sean, any, any data coming out of that? Um, there's there's uh, data out of some of the projects that are administrative, if you will, that improve cost savings. You know, the HHS Accelerate program uh, that, that that I talked about was a was a twenty five million dollar a year savings. Um, I, I see a lot of in the payer provider um, groups that I've I've uh, been looking at that they are looking at administrative um, approaches first. And that's that, that's from a regulatory standpoint is the is the safer way to go to. So so you look at the provider directory. Um, I've seen I've seen some in the in the private sector that have had some advancement and some success, um, but I haven't seen again a formal analysis of that. So I would say that the administrative um, efforts have shown some success, but a lot of it is still behind closed doors. And again, we get into 
you know, is it the business model? Is it the technical challenges? Is it, is it the governance challenges? Um, those, those are, are where we are, we've started to explore at Equity and Health. We've, you know, spent a few, two years, almost, we're almost two years old at this point. And, 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 you know, myself and Heather Flannery, our CEO, have been around in this industry area for a while. So we've been exploring where those successes and failures have taken place. And based on that, we are now trying a new approach. We're just getting started with that. So it's going to be a year or two, I think, before we get some data that we can um, really look at. And we're, we're, we're I, I come from a research background. If I'm not doing a health outcome study with what we're doing, you know, as I, I like to joke, you know, we don't just want to make a Pokemon Go. Just because people are using your product and people like your product and people are rah, rah, doesn't mean your product is helping people. And that's something we need to be sure of, but that takes time to set up. And I would say it's going to be a year or two before we get the answers on our own efforts. Um, but there are other groups out there that are doing this. And I, I, you know, all the time we see papers come in, uh, you know, for, for, for different journals and different places. Um, I do think that the industry at, at large has a hesitancy to share. And I wish that would um, change a little bit. Uh, Dr. Farrar, who just asked the question, he, he is the chair of the HIMSS Blockchain Task Force, and he's he's trying to pull together people to do that from a from a nonprofit setting, from a from a joint effort. Getting that co-opetition, you know, as as mentioned in the other other question in the chat, is really really key. And I, I think getting people to be able to do that, but also understanding that the current incentivization and pressures, both in business as well as ag in academic research are to not share until you can own it and put it out there. That's one of the, that's one of the big challenges that we all face in the industry. And so I think I think the work that B, BBA is doing and and other groups like Kim's that uh, that 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 Jorge is, uh, is um, uh, the 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 chair of the blockchain task force are are absolutely critical to to getting those lessons learned. And again, I go back to um, some of the work we're doing with Dell Medical School and artifacts. Um, really getting our hands around a large amount of information that's uh, that's not standardized as as well as key. There's no there's no library for this. I think there are there's a handful of in individuals out there who I know of who have larger private libraries of blockchain and healthcare information than than even Gartner. I've met with Gartner and they do great work. When they, you know, here's the hype cycle and here's where it is. One, Gartner always looks at blockchain and healthcare as one conglomerate. Needs to break that up a little bit. Two. I've talked to them and the, the volume of blockchain and healthcare material that they've they've gathered is impressive, but it's not as, as impressive as, as some of the individuals I've known who either have done graduate theses, uh, theses, theses um, or, or other investigation. And so I think as an industry, figuring out how to get our hands around all that information so we aren't just continually recreating wheels and have no idea what wheels work, that's going to be key as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, the point Sean made, uh, I would like to emphasize that, you know, it, it, the negative finding is also very, very important, not just the positive findings. And there is a there's a tendency in science to only publish, you know, uh, the, the positive results and because we are still very early. So we need to know what is not working so that we don't waste our resources on those projects. So if you have conducted a project, whether it's a small scale or large scale and uh, the outcomes are inconclusive, things didn't work, or there was no difference in outcomes, do publish that data, please, because it's very, very important for us. Uh, there's a question from Natalia, Sophia. Is there, is there any measurable change through this consortium presented in a sense how to move forward from this closed system to the new co-opetition model um, that you have described? And are there any use cases that can be picked up faster in the pharma industry for readiness. Um, and, and again, this 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 is similar to some of the themes that you and you and Jorge have brought up. I think um, you know for, for for hard and fast data on on lessons learned, it's it's not out there. It's not captured yet. I'm I'm literally trying to do that as you know when I when I say I'm the federated uh, network orchestration lead for our organization, we are moving to a new model of, okay, what did we learn from these other things? What has worked? What has not worked? How can we do it differently? And, and I'm approaching that from a, from a business analysis as well as, as scientific analysis standpoint. So that's work I have ongoing this year. I don't have, I don't have the results of that, but it needs to be done because I haven't seen it out there anywhere. Um, there's, there's the general sense that you can get more value from a, a consortium than you can from a, a single entity. And that's because a single entity is usually by, by, by way of top-down force said, this is how we're gonna trust each other. And whether it works or not, that's one thing, but replacing that with a different system is sometimes not cost-effective from the minds of, of, of those who are in charge of that whole system. But working across systems, that's untapped area. 
you know, I don't think I've seen any, you know, a uh, system where, where 15 different pharma companies are sharing data with each other. That's a different yeah. approach entirely. And I know, I, I know Natalia works with Pharma Ledger and probably knows the detail even in more depth than me, both, both the, the promise and the, the challenges. But that's, that's one thing that, that, you know, we want to explore more and I think get into both, both cross-sectional discussion about it from different people from different vantage points, but also starting to wrap it into, um, here's a meta-analysis, here's a systematic review on this particular use case or these particular use cases across this particular industry vertical. Yeah, thank you. Simon, there's a question, I think, for you. Uh, has NHS demonstrated any use cases in healthcare? And also, I wanted to ask you as well, uh, we have received a couple of um, uh, queries from NHS Hospital. Um, I know you work for NHS Digital, but do you do any work outside, like in a, in, in a private capacity? Uh, some, some hospitals are looking to explore the use of blockchain for medical records and healthcare records. So, um, uh, so two questions, yes. Thank you. Yeah, so I think, I mean, large scale usage, you know, sort of within the NHS, um, you know, from from my knowledge isn't there. So, I mean, I, I, I kind of work at quite a high level. So, uh, you know, I, I know it's not, um, you know, it's not, it's not everywhere yet. Uh, I know there have been um, uh, smaller kind of use cases of, uh, of blockchain for various, you know, various different applications. Um, and, uh, you know, and I have seen a kind of, um, smaller trust from, you know, from some of the documents that, you know, that I've kind of seen in, in, in the open, um, open space, but, um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I think we're sort of a way, a way off from it being kind of, you know, used, uh, extensively. Um, and I think, um, I think it will probably be, uh, we'll probably see it come into applications that we didn't necessarily see it. So the decentralized identity thing, you know, I think, you know, that's probably a space where, you know, you'll see uh, a big tech leader kind of suddenly kind of switch into that method because it's easier for them to implement. And then suddenly we might find, you know, blockchain and decentralized identity kind of being adopted at a, a bit of a bigger level. And then that opens the doors for, you know, people kind of adopting, you know, blockchain as a, you know, as a, as a technology wider. So I would, I would suspect, you know, we, we might find something kind of coming in left field and that, that kind of opens the door a little bit for, um, for the rest of the applications. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly from, from my experience, I, I, um, yeah, just work predominantly sort of NHS kind of public side and yeah, my time has sort of been eaten up with, uh, with pandemic and, uh, and kind of just responding to that, that security threat over that period for now. Uh, certainly something I, you know, I'd like to kind of expand a little bit when I, uh, when I have a bit more spare time, which I'm hoping will, uh, will appear over this, this next year or so. Thank you. Yeah, there's another question. Is interoperability also a problem for NHS that emerging technologies can can address? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the the, the model, um, you know, as, as you know, is, um, you know, we have lots, lots and lots of different trusts that, that are their own entities, um, you know, and there's, there's, there's quite a lot of us that kind of work in the space in the arms length bodies kind of working as a, you know, as, as a whole. Um, but I think, you know, some of the kind of use cases and, and things we, we discussed earlier, um, I, you know, I think could probably, you know, probably start to kind of help, you know, help in that area, you know, like say data sharing and, you know, some of those, some of those areas blockchain, you know, would be prime for that. But I think it's, it's about having that you know, having that adoption in the first place, you know, having a kind of compelling argument to kind of come and say, you know, let's, let's start to bring it in. Let's see what those, you know, what those benefits are. Um, you know, cause I think, uh, I think it's fair to say, you know, certainly at the moment, you know, healthcare, uh, in the, in the public sector is, you know, is stretched with, you know, a number of different challenges. So, you know, kind of technology adoption, you know, as much as it can save lots of time and lots of money, it's also quite difficult, uh, to kind of implement in the first place. And you know it kind of costs time and people's effort and uh and things like that so um but just going back to one of the questions around the kind of pharma industry i was uh involved in um some chats with the united nations criminal research institute uh, and they did um, a full kind of uh 
paper and assessment about supply chain. They, they took a lot of different industries, kind of gold and, you know, but pharma, uh, you know, and, and uh, money printing, et cetera, were all kind of part of that conversation. I think, I think it's out there in the wild. I'll try and have a dig to see where the published documents were. Uh, but they certainly kind of had pharma as an industry, you know, that uh, blockchain may be able to kind of come and secure, um, you know, stopping kind of um, supply chain thefts. Uh, making sure that you know the drugs aren't watered down during the process as it were so um so that's definitely kind of a use case you know that i think you know has been looked at kind of wider by you know uh, united nations and and others so thank you very much thanks um just one last kind of uh, question comment before we conclude and I, I would like to invite both of you really to 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 comment on that is around um empowerment patient empowerment and when we talk about decentralized um, identity, we are looking at uh, you know uh, more uh, empowerment for the patients, but also um, managing their own welfare, their own identity, their own keys, as you mentioned. And um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done around education. Um, you know, they say with great power comes great responsibility. Are our, our, our journal public and patients ready? to manage their own private keys and manage their own affairs or, or, or because we have left it to the hands of third parties, isn't it, or, 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 or the, over the centuries. So just your comments on where we are and, and what steps should be taken or what steps have been taken already to, for patient education or person education as Sean mentioned. Uh, so Sean, I would start with you. Uh, certainly, and 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 yeah, the you know, call it the, the the participant or the consumer, and it's critical in healthcare. You want the people who are have being helped by the healthcare to be enabled, to be empowered, and to be involved. And that's and that's going to be a different layer uh, at, at any point. If you go back to the the nineteen eighties, how many people were using uh, a, a, an automated teller machine for their banking versus going in the bank? Now you're lucky if you can find a bank that has has a person you can go see. I, I you know I, I I use a particular large uh, a, a large brand bank here where I am in Pittsburgh, and and there's no in person offices. There are ATMs, and then there's a there's one larger center where I can get a video screen with somebody else. So there literally is nowhere for me to go to go see a bank teller. Whereas 30 years, 40 years ago, that was not the case. I think you're going to see a progression of adoption. You're not going to see all there or all not there. Are people going to use private and public keys with ease? Um, right now, there's probably, you know, one to 10, one percent who's already doing it and 10 percent who are probably capable of picking it up right away. Um, you're going to have younger generations who pick it up more quickly. You're going to have older generations that are both resistant, but also going to take a different type of education and, and onboarding. But I see those taxonomies changing over time and how and how quickly they change has to be worked into the plans for this. If you if you expect everybody on Earth to start using your system, well, it's going to have to look more. It's going to have to have a lot of different uh, UI UX for a lot of different people, including those who aren't even connected to the Internet. Those who are so 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 considering those factors and then figuring out how to move them over time, not just the one piece of tech, but the technology infrastructure underpinning it is going to be absolutely critical. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Simon, any final thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, just to add, you know, I think um, obviously working in a, uh, in a digital company as we do, um, it's, it's about accessibility and it's about, you know, kind of, you know, supporting patients, um, you know, kind of across the board, really. So accessibility, uh, you know, the different language, um, uh, et cetera, means that, you know, if you deploy in a technology, it, it's got to be right. And it's got to be right for, you know, for for everyone that you serve. And obviously the NHS kind of serves, you know, serves, serves everyone. Um, so I think, um, you know, coming back to Sean's point as well, it, it is um who, who can use that kind of technology it's you know it's quite difficult to use you know and you'll probably end up with different ecosystems maybe in the future of yeah you know kind of having strong decentralized kind of key management for decentralized identity uh, but then also fully having people kind of popping up that, that um that look after it maybe trusted trusted resources maybe like you know your bank or or you know uh, another central agent that, that will allow you to come and do resets etc because i think you know you'll find that 
people will will lose control and lose access. But but I think there is a real push for you know for people to have that kind of decentralized kind of view of their own data. You know, if it's not free, uh, then you are the product and all of that kind of thing. I know Tim Berners Lee with his kind of solid project, et cetera, and, and similar things. Um, yeah, I can I can see that being a push over, you know, over over the next few years, but it's gonna take a while. I think we're definitely kind of at the beginning of, of any uh, of any real uh, big big journey. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. And thank you, Sean. With that, we conclude our uh, webinar. Great presentations, excellent feedback coming in the chat. Uh, this, uh, this session will be uploaded on our YouTube channel in a couple of weeks time. And all those who attended will receive a certificate of attendance uh, in, in their email. And uh, we'll see you next month. And hopefully all of you uh, be able to join us in March uh, in our online uh, conference. So thank you very much to both speakers and all those who attended, and uh, we'll see you next month at our webinar. Uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Cheers. Goodbye.